Good morning. Well, for those of us that call Axe Church home, this has been a year, as you know, that, and it continues to be, that's been laser focused on building God's church. And you just saw some of how that happens. It's through service. But not just in our process of literally constructing a, and renovating a new building through which we can serve one another and our communities, but in building our own individual and collective legacy, building something that truly lasts. And it is all about building. It's about construction. So I brought you this morning extra extra added benefit into the message today, some super lame construction jokes. So I need you to outgrown first service. And there were more of them here. To... So here's the first one. Why did the plumber quit his job? It was too draining. Let's get, see? Good groan, good groan. And actually some laughs too. So uh, what did the construction worker say when the window broke? That was painful, very close, very close, good job. What did the general contractor, how did the general contractor react when he saw a jumbled mess of electrical work? He was shocked. Come on now. Last one. Why did the exterior painting crew show up all bundled up on a blisteringly hot day? They were told that the job required putting on two coats. Get it? Yeah, yeah, good groans. You know, we get it all out, you're feeling better now. We're going to talk about the important stuff as we move forward here. Well, the building project or process is exciting and it's challenging, right? I still, frankly, have a purple thumbnail from Hope Week and some deep scratches uh, that were part of the battle scars that came from the effort over a month ago now to make progress in the building that will be Axe Church's new home. And you see, it's a part of what we do. There's a sacrifice that's required. There are battle scars that come from this building process. But if we want to build a life of legacy, a life that transforms us more and more into the character of Jesus, because we are moving closer and closer to him, if we want that life that truly is getting better every day, then we have to surrender to the fact that it's a lifelong process of building on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And that kind of building is always good, but it always comes with a bit of struggle, like the metamorphosis of the caterpillar coming out of that cocoon to become what it's intended to be, or the seed that has to break through the earth and stretch towards the sun. It's a process that should never end for any of us because it's our best life possible. But the most interesting part is it's really not about us. It's about what we can give back to God because of his amazing love and his sacrifices for us. Now, Cameron has spoken to us over the past few months um, out of the book of Nehemiah, making some excellent points that, that the story of Nehemiah shares. And I really want to double down on that today. And I have to tell you, I had 10 points, and that would have kept you here an hour just for me. And Cameron's like, you know, cut it back. And, but, but please, read the book of Nehemiah, start to finish, because I can only touch on five different lessons that we can learn today. But the whole story is just such a portrait of what building is all about. And we'll get to a lot of the good stuff here this morning. It gives us a portrait of what it takes to build what will last. And that's what we want to do by relying on God's power and pursuing his will. So just a little bit of background about Nehemiah. Uh, God's people, the Israelites, had been sent out of Israel to Babylon in exile. And part of that was their own disobedience, and part of it was the fact that Israel has always been a land bridge between Africa and Europe and Asia that everyone wanted the land, not for its natural resources, because it has little, but for its, its place, and it's interesting as the Holy Land, that it becomes this war-torn piece of land for virtually all time until Jesus returns. And the people had been, God's people had been sent out in exile, but they were coming back. He was bringing his people home to Jerusalem. And this is taking place about 500 years before the birth of Jesus. 
But Jerusalem is in ruins, and the people are frightened, and they're unfocused. And Nehemiah, who was an, a Hebrew that had been born in exile, but he was serving as the cupbearer to the king of Persia. He heard about this news, and he knew he had to do something, but he needed to do it with God's power. And the story begins in chapter one, and he says, one of my brothers came from Judah and said to me, those who survived exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. Well, here's our first lesson from those first verses out of Nehemiah. To build a lasting legacy, we must care about God's plan and God's people. So does your heart break for what breaks God's heart? Well, if it does, that's where all of this starts. Building a lasting legacy starts with allowing your heart to be broken and then leaning into that space, into that need. But think about it for real. What does your heart break for? Is it poverty? Is it pain? Is it injustice? Is it knowing that so many people are far from God and lost? God wants our hearts to be softened to feel heartbreak because he wants to use us to bring him into situations where he can redeem the burdens. Let me say that again. God wants to soften our hearts to actually feel the heartbreak because he wants to use us to bring him into situations where he can redeem the pain and the burdens. You see, our flesh is really, really good at wanting to avoid heartbreak, right? We want to avoid it or we want to bury it. We want to turn our eyes away from it. We often aren't comfortable in this mess of pain that consumes our world. But Jesus, on the other hand, saw and felt others' pain. He entered in. He sees and he feels your pain. And he's in the business of redeeming pain. His sacrifice for our sin is the ultimate redemption. I mean, he came to earth to fully experience all of the pain that we have ever collectively felt. He was fully human and fully God. And he overcame death so that we could have eternal life pain-free. So as we surrender to our lives to him and our need for a savior who has been through that and overcome sin and death, he wants to tenderize our hearts to be sensitive to the heartbreak that's around us, which enables us to point others to his love and to express his love through our actions. But we can get desensitized to pain and to heartbreak that's around us. And if that's you, and that's certainly been me in stages of my life, it's just easier to not feel sometimes, isn't it? But if that's you, we need to be honest and to ask God to open the eyes of our hearts so that we can feel and see the needs around us. When Nehemiah's heart was breaking for the people of God, did he whip out his sword and take off for Jerusalem? Did he send gold by camel to the city officials to get that wall done? Did he say, good luck with the wall, I'll be praying for you? No, he sat down and cried. What kind of leader is that? Well, it turns out it's the kind of leader that God empowers. A leader with a heart for who and for what God loves. Nehemiah actually stopped to feel the pain and to, to take the opportunity to enter into the struggle that the people were experiencing. And that's where we need to start. We need to not pass go, not collect the $200 until we have stopped to experience the pain if we want to grow in impact and influence for Jesus and leave this legacy that lasts, to truly build something that lasts. But that's not easy. We can know it, but we do have this twisted view of strength as being free from tears, and that's just not biblical. Jesus wept over Lazarus. God is saddened for his people many times in scripture. 
And Nehemiah understands that experiencing the emotion that comes with brokenness is step one in his own growth, but also in his ability to do anything about the problem that God wants to redeem and restore. So can I give you a challenge this morning? I tell you, here it comes. The next time that you hear of something heartbreaking, now that's going to be the first time you pick up your phone or turn on the television, isn't it? Or have a conversation. The next time you hear something heartbreaking, take 90 seconds. It may seem like an eternity, but take 90 seconds to literally be quiet and feel the heartbreak. Feel its impact through your body and in your spirit. It's not 90 seconds of protesting why it's wrong. It's not 90 seconds of how you can fix it or speak into the situation and give advice. It's not 90 seconds of even discussing it with anybody else. But feeling it. Let the tears come if they're there. Now, if this is new to you or not something you're really into, (laughs) it's going to be super uncomfortable. But let it happen because this is where legacy starts. It starts from what God wants to do, and that's always his process of redeeming his people. But we have to feel the fracture of this broken world. And for some of us, it's about, we like to be disconnected from that and hold it off. And for others of you, you're, you may be quite empathetic in your spirit, and you feel the heartbreak all the time, and you're like, no, I just can't take any more. So I promise the pain will pass. For some, the 90 seconds will seem like eternity, and for others, you're like, I live there all the time. But it will pass if we're focused on simply just letting God do what he wants to do in our bodies, in our spirit, as we feel heartbreak. Pay attention to what happens in and through you. Don't rush it. Our ability to grow and to build starts with the stimulus of change. And that always involves pain. It just does. But that pain has purpose. So will you take that challenge and learn to be comfortable with feeling the heartbreak? Okay, well, let's go on to see what Nehemiah does next. And literally in the next several verses, a bit condensed here, it says, For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And then I said, Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keeps his commandment. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer of your servant is praying before you day and night for the servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins that we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws that you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instructions you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even though your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them back to the place that I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed with your great strength and your mighty hand, Lord. Let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering in your name. Give your servant success today by granting him presence in the favor of this man." Now, this man that he's referring to is that Nehemiah is asking favor for himself because he's going to go ask the king of Persia if he can go back to Jerusalem and help rebuild this wall. The king of Persia has nothing in this that would say he would allow that to happen. First of all, Nehemiah is his servant and he likes him as his servant. Second of all, the king of Persia is not interested in advancing the aims of God's people or helping them rebuild rebuild at all. And yet, Nehemiah is coming before the Lord, seeking him in in prayer, and then speaking with him and saying, God, I want to go do this. Help me go do this. But I need your favor with the king. You see, the second point, after we experience the heartbreak and actually feel it, We have to pray and spend time with God, listening for him and speaking with him. 
Notice that Nehemiah in those verses spent days pursuing God before taking any other action. And he's honest with God. He's confessing the shortcomings and he's asking God's blessing to accomplish God's will. And this is powerful and can often be overlooked or at least kind of pushed off to the side by people who are very focused on doing. This section of scripture reminds me a lot of the Lord's Prayer as Jesus taught us to pray. Nehemiah acknowledges God's goodness and his position over all things. He confesses the sins of the people and of his own, and he asks God boldly for his will to be done as given to Moses by granting favor. These are powerful prayers. I have to wonder how each decision point in our day might change if we walked through that prayer and spent time listening to God speak into our lives as we learn and try to take more of his word into our hearts every day as well, how those decisions might change. If we pushed pause after feeling the need, we spoke with and listened for what God had to say in this continual dialogue that he desires with us. Well, the story continues as Nehemiah moves from seeking and speaking with God to actually interacting with the king of Persia. And in chapter two, Nehemiah says, the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? Can this be nothing but sadness of the heart? And Nehemiah says, I was very much afraid. And he should have been. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. It's a great way to start, by the way, right? A little bit of sucking up going on there. May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. The king said to me, what is it that you want? And then I prayed to the God of heaven. He prayed one more time before speaking. And I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. And the king let him. This is crazy. This is not what should have happened. He could have been not only denied this, but the king could have took his life for basically being insubordinate. I don't want to serve you anymore. I want to go serve my own people. But the king let him because Nehemiah was prepared, because he had sought God's will, because he had sought favor with the king. Then God allowed this to happen. You see, the next point is, the next lesson that we can learn from Nehemiah is that in building this lasting legacy, we've got to step out and try. And sometimes it won't look like it's going to be successful. But action is required to accomplish God's plan, and he has set our world up that way, and we have a privilege of being a part of that plan. Honestly, we may never, ever get the exact project charter for what, our, what God's will for our life is on earth. We never exactly know which actions to take one after another, but God is always faithful to focus us and give us light on that one next step, the one ask that we need to make, like Nehemiah making his ask of the king. And that one step at a time is the definition of a life that is dependent on God. Remember Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12 when God told him to go but didn't say where? He's like, go and I'll tell you when, I get, when you get there. That's the faith life, isn't it? So question for you, have you ever felt stuck or unable to take action because you just don't know, you're confused about what God's plan is for your life? Well, I've been there. Maybe you have too, and I think we're making it too hard. Or at least we're making it way too specific. Because think about this. There are so many, 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 many things that we can be sure are God's will for our lives. His, His word tells us, he tells all of us to take action, to seek him with our whole heart. We could spend the rest of our life just doing that. And we would be serving all sorts of people out of the overflow if we spent all of our time just simply seeking 
him with our whole heart. But he also tells us to love others with truth and grace. He, he tells us to care for widows and orphans. He tells us to share Jesus with those who don't know him, to share our blessings, and to equip and build his church. And I could go on and on about the things that God has already said his will is for us. We could spend literally the rest of our living hours on this earth taking actions in any one or all of those pursuits and know that we are squarely within the will of God. It may not come to us like a job description written on the side of a rock. It may not be abundantly clear which team to join when you leave the service today. Just join one. Just get out and try. Because you know whichever one you just decide that you are going to take on for a trial run, it's going to be in God's will. Because we are building his church based on his word. We do it because it brings God glory. And we're told scripturally never to touch the glory. It's God's glory. But we've got to touch the work. We have to touch the work to get involved, to create that ownership that the three leaders were talking about up here just a little bit ago, because we have the opportunity to enter into what his will is. It happens in the church. It happens outside the church. It happens in our relationships. But we can know that we are squared up with his will and we will give him the glory. And when we do, his power will go with us as it did with Nehemiah. But you all know that when you step out to do something, what happens? We invite criticism. It's the human condition. We have to expect that. It's not fun. It's never fun. But we have to expect that criticism and opposition and resistance will come and commit to working through conflict. So here's how it went down for Nehemiah in chapter 4. When Sanballat, who was a Sumerian man of influence, heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became very angry and greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? You can hear the snarkiness, can't you? And Tobiah the Ammonite, who is at his side, doubles down and says, what are they building? Even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall of stones. Smart Alex. They're trying to drive a wedge into the confidence that the people had. We understand this, don't we? That when we're questioned, when we're mocked, when we're scoffed at, what happens to our confidence? Being mocked can shut us down, or it can fire us up to fight. And neither is helpful in accomplishing God's will. That's what Satan would love for us to do. But that's why those first three lessons are so important. Feeling the heartbreak, understanding what the need is, seeking God, and then stepping out and trying, knowing that resistance will come. We need to be confident in God, not in our own effort and his ultimate victory and our surrender to his will. And if we're squared up to that, the mockers and the scoffers, they're just noise. Jesus, of course, is our example here, and he was mocked and he was ridiculed by those who, was igno who were ignorant to who he was. And he tells us that we can accept, expect that we'll get similar treatment. But he's our defender and our power source. And we are pow empowered by him to speak the truth in love when we engage those that would come against him and, and therefore us. But the practical and the very difficult human challenge is this, that instead of reacting to those who mock us for stepping out for what God is trying to accomplish, can we let our heart break for what they're missing? I'm talking about some grown-up stuff here. This is hard. Can we let our heart break for what they're missing? If they knew, if those who would come against us knew of his goodness and his love, it would be different. But until they do, of course, they're going to come against him and against you because they desire control. 
takes a lot of maturity to see that those who would challenge us are the very people who need what we have most. Jesus. So we have to keep our confidence because of who our confidence is in and understand that we, our hearts can break for those even that are coming against us and how we engage them with truth and with love. Well, Nehemiah doesn't wallow in the muck or set out to fight when this resistance comes towards him. He does something that actually helps. He cries out to God. We go on in chapter four and he says, hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt and blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults into the face of the builders. So he is angry, right? You hear his anger, but he's telling God. He's telling somebody who can do something about it. He's not fighting with Sanballat and Tobiah. So we rebuilt the wall until all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs of Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they became very angry. They all plotted to come together and fight against Jerusalem and to stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet the threat. Meanwhile, the people actually in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. And also our enemies said, before they know it or, or, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we will kill them and put an end to this work. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed place, did posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, will fight for your families and your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. The work is extensive and spread out. And we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. Now, I need to remind you that even back then, 500 years before the birth of Christ, Jerusalem is a big city. It miles and miles of wall that we're talking about here, several stories high, built out of limestone. This is back-breaking, agonizing work that these mere humans couldn't probably have accomplished on their own without the enemy's influence, let alone having workers standing in one place and people with spears and, and bows in another place trying to keep the enemy at bay. It wouldn't have been a fun time. This would make a great Netflix series, wouldn't it? There's a lot of drama here. This is a big wall that needs to be built. This is hard work. There's lots of danger. This is something that can't be accomplished without supernatural involvement. But that's the business that God is in. You see, to build a lasting legacy, we have to face the opposition that will come and stay true to the mission. Building that Christ-like life has a price. It's a sacrifice that's required to be a Christ follower. And I can't convince myself or you or anybody else that that's worthwhile unless you truly, deeply, really understand what's been sacrificed for you. Jesus's willingness to feel every physical and emotional pain that's possible and to take the weight of the sin of the world upon himself to the point of his own death, it's overwhelming. And it should be overwhelming, and it should overwhelm us all with gratitude that instead of getting what we deserve, which is separation from God in eternal turmoil, we get the promise of being in God's full presence without evil, without pain, without tears that are caused by the brokenness that we experience in this life on earth. So whatever small sacrifices that we make in comparison to Jesus' sacrifice, they're not only worthwhile, but they can actually bring great satisfaction in the knowledge that we are advancing his will, that we are working on his behalf and suffering on his behalf, because suffering for him is never in vain. It's a value, 
And Nehemiah pressed on in the face of great danger and challenge because he knew our God will fight for us. Now there's real dangers that he was facing and there are real dangers in this temporal world that we live in. And still God tells us that he has overcome the world and that our eternal destiny is secure when we put our faith and our trust in him. And that should free us to face adversity, knowing that he is with us and he is for us no matter what we do. Our acts to further his will will be meaningful in a world that is so desperately looking for meaning. The key to managing that resistance that can and will come to us is to recognize it and then hand it back to God because he's the only one with the power to defeat it. The power to defeat what comes at us in our thoughts, that comes at us in relational conflict, that comes at us in circumstances that come against us. Now, a lot of us maybe know this, but why do we still spin on all the resistance? Maybe you don't, but I do. <laughs> it's hard to capture each and every one of those thoughts and separate lies from truth and to understand that Jesus has already handled all of the junk and he wants to take the junk that comes into your mind, that comes into your life and into your circumstances. He doesn't need you to do it. He's already done it. He doesn't need your willpower. He needs your separation of truth from lie. So here's a really simple basic example, but it's also a true confession of resistance. Let's go back to Hope Week. Satan absolutely wants an amazing effort like Hope Week with so many people being involved to try to advance God's mission here through Acts Church in the Illinois Valley. He, Satan wants that to fail, no doubt. So sometimes he can attack with, you know, I don't know, big overt kinds of things, but mostly, I found he's very unoriginal, but effective in attacking in basically the same side, the double-edged sword of doubt. And I have to tell you that for me, there were so many awesomely talented, skilled, gifted people working three shifts a day for that week of Hope Week, that when I started physically becoming drained after the first shift, Satan started whispering. He started saying, you're not contributing enough. People are noticing that, by the way. You're not good enough. You aren't one of the people that is meant to be in the middle of this. Whether it's Hope Week or whether it's any point in your life, I don't know if you've ever heard those thoughts come into your head. I know them to be lies and no one here was saying them out loud, but I was contemplating checking out. I'm not, I'm not doing enough. Maybe I should just sit on the sidelines. Oh, he would have loved that. We need to separate the lies from the truth and push forward anyway. And for those that hear the unworthy comments, you know that it's not true. As a Christ follower, you have been made worthy because of what Jesus has done for you. And separating those lies and saying, Jesus, you already died for this. Please take it. I'm going to take one more step forward. I'm going to dig one more hole. I'm going to do whatever it is when you hear that to overcome the resistance. The flip side of it, of course, is feeling like we are all that and feeling like others aren't giving their all. And so we have this tension and this turmoil that we either feel unworthy or that we're feeling judgmental of other people's worthiness. Both are equal lies because Jesus has made us all worthy to bring our skills and our gifts and our time and our talent and our treasure together for his glory. But the resistance will come and it can be subtle, but it can be very effective if we're not aware of it. We have to expect that and more when we're doing what we believe is honoring for God. 
capture each thought, name it as a lie if it is, and give it back to Jesus to handle, and then keep going with open hearts and open hands. Well, we've come a long way in the story, but we get now to Nehemiah's let's go moment. And in chapter six, the enemies, they, the enemies, were trying to frighten us all, thinking that their hands are too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. And the wall was completed in 52 days. When our enemies heard about this, all of the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Super cool. You see, if we feel the need, understand the heartbreak, if we seek God, if we take action, and if we persevere through opposition, we will see results. Results matter. And mostly they matter in terms of what's happening in your own heart. Because if it is growing in Christ-likeness, whatever physical tasks need to be accomplished will be accomplished with God's power as the Nehemiah story unveils. Yeah, they worked hard, but it was with his power that it was accomplished because the outcomes always belong to God. Nehemiah knew that and he simply asked for what was needed, strengthen my hands. He was dependent upon God's empowerment and it showed not only in the work that got accomplished, but in the message that it communicated to their enemies. They knew that this wasn't just a human effort. So Acts Church, you know it, but we are at a Nehemiah let's go moment. You know, it's, 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 it's exciting, it's challenging, it's work, and it's what God wants for our body of Christ. A few months ago, you know, uh, Cameron had challenged us to just simply find where God's moving and get in the flow when we think about what, what our purpose in life is and what we are to do for God. Well, it had become clear to me and my husband Brad you know, four years ago when we found this church on accident, we were supposed to go to a different church that morning, that God was working here, that there was a flow of the Holy Spirit that comes through this place because it co it's coming through you, the people of Acts, to want to reach the Illinois Valley with his love, with God's love. And we couldn't bear missing out on that. So we were weekenders up here, and now as of this week, we've officially moved to Peru. We're five minutes from here. We're gonna be four minutes from the new place because we don't wanna miss out on the spreading of the spirit of God and what he's doing in and through the people here. We wanna be a part of that. And part of the legacy of Jesus' love that we all, want to build and pass on involves literally building a wall and a stage and kids rooms and a kitchen and storage areas in the dungeon i mean basement of the new building and god is directing and empowering the work through us we can go and we can touch it we can be a part of it and we can give the glory back to him and there's very much physical work that needs to be accomplished but one of the things that I've been so impressed with, with all of you, is that there is a lot of work that needs to be done and my mind always goes to what's the most efficient way to do it. Let's just get after it, let's get it done. Let's not have any fun while we're doing it because that's the way I was raised. And that's not what's happened, is it? He's been working through so many of you with your generosity of time, talent, and treasure. The work is getting done, but it's also getting done while people make us and serve us food, while those that are very skilled in various uh, construction pursuits, let's say brick masonry, not only have been doing a ton of work, but actually taking the time to show young kids how to mix mortar and lay bricks. It's huge. It's, it's the opportunity that other leaders have taken to extend their patience and encouragement when kids want to paint fence and they're getting more paint on themselves than on the fence. And it's the experience and the patience that people are giving to people like me who have no skills with power tools when I'm given the encouragement of, yeah, just try driving that screw one more time, you'll get it. You see, all of this matters. 
the work is being accomplished, but it's really being accomplished through the physical results, but more importantly, how we feel the expansion of our hearts, how we're being called and stretched to rely on God and to rely on one another more, how we're bonding and becoming closer in everything that we do. Don't miss out on this opportunity to be involved in what's happening in this physical space, in what's happening at the new physical space, but most importantly, what's happening in the relationships between all of you and the God that we serve. Don't miss out. We have gotta get in the flow to see those results. We have no real or lasting strength out of our own flesh. And that where we access joy is by understanding that our deep personal relationship with God will be the access point to that joy that empowers us to make a difference for Jesus. We have to fall in love with Jesus. And yes, to my brothers in Christ out there, that can sound weird, but it's not. Falling in love with Jesus is the, because he is the source of love and of peace and of joy and of comfort and encouragement. What's not to love? We tap into joy by spending time with knowing him more deeply all the time through his word and then reflecting on what he's done across all time for his people. And that's how the book of Nehemiah ends. Seriously, go home this week and read the book of Nehemiah. It's so good to start to finish. But it ends with this reflection on God's goodness where they read, the, they read the, the, the word of God from sunup till afternoon. And yeah, I only had 30 minutes today. But it's good. It is good. And they found that the joy of the Lord is their strength. You see, God's character is perfect. And he gives us an example like Nehemiah who let his heart break for what breaks God's heart who sought God before taking his own actions, who then stepped out in faith, who expected resistance but moved forward in God's strength, and who also expected results, especially in his own heart and the hearts of the people around him. So not a theoretical question, who's the hero of the book of Nehemiah? God. Yeah, it'd be, in, it'd be easy to focus on Nehemiah as being the good servant here. But God's the hero. He's always the hero. He is the, the source of this, this book we call the Bible. It's his character revealed, his goodness revealed. He is always the hero. Nehemiah was simply a vessel, a, a willing vessel, who knew that he could trust God to work in and through him. So do you trust Jesus enough to live life like Nehemiah did? Are you reachable? Are you open to heartbreak? Are you teachable? Open to humbling yourself to God's ways and the wisdom of others who follow him? Are you accountable, ready to make commitments to lean into that process that God revealed through this story by sharing our intentions and our victories and our failures with our brothers and sisters in Christ so that we can be in a source of encouragement and support? And will you apply these principles in building his church through the mission that's in front of Acts right now? You know, it, it's not lost on me that one of the reasons that Brad and I came to this area to begin with, and, and it still remains one of, the, one of our draws to the area, is that we love to hike and we love the state parks. They're built out of sandstone. <laughs> How ironic is that? They're beautiful, but they're sandstone. They crumble, the rock faces fall. They're changing all the time. They're only, they were only made because the glaciers could cut through the soft sand. They're beautiful, but they're not something to build your life on. We have to build something that lasts on the rock, who is Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Oh, Father, will you strengthen our hands? Will you strengthen our hearts? Will you cause us to not only see and know the needs that are around us, but to seek you, to seek you in all that we do, to listen for your promptings, and then to take action? 
We want to see results, Lord. We want to see hearts changed, souls saved. We know that this body of believers is committed. Lord, cause us to just take your word one more step today in whatever direction that means for our individual hearts so that we can accomplish your will and we'll give you all the glory as we get into the work. In Jesus' name, amen.